So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone on the presentation. I'm Chris Hines, Product Marketing Manager here at the company, and I'm joined today with Moni Salam. Moni is an engineer. So Moni, thanks for being here, dude. Um, today, what we're going to do is talk about Docker Data Center, right? This is our enterprise solution. Uh, we'll give you a bit of an overview of what it is, and then Moni here will show you an actual demo of the solution so you can get to see it firsthand. And at the end, we'll save some time for some questions and answers. Um, so if you've been on these presentations before, you kind of know how it works. Uh, this presentation is being recorded. So um, what we'll do is we'll follow up with you later on this week. We'll send out the recording to you via email so you can check it out again. You can share it with anyone that you would like and um, give it another watch. All right. Again, we'll save about 12 to 15 minutes towards the end so you can you know, ask any questions that you have. Um, you can feel free to post questions throughout the presentation. Um, there's a little portal here in WebEx. You might have seen it. It says Q&A. Uh, you can go ahead and post any questions that you have to that section, and we will do our best to address those towards the end of the presentation. So without further ado, let's get started. So we are Docker Inc. Uh, we started as an open source company um, a few years back, and we've since then pivoted to a commercial product as well, a commercial entity, if you will. Um, we are the primary contributors and sponsors of the Docker open source project, right? So there's about 5 billion image pools that have been pulled from our registries. Um, there's about 2,500 contributors who are actively contributing to this Docker project, and there's about 500,000 plus Dockerized applications that are out there today. Um, but we realized this, um, and it started as kind of like this cool developer tool, but it's evolved over time. It's actually evolved into a, a product that's being used in production. And that's why we have that stat there on the right-hand side, where you see that out of folks who are using Docker, 51% are actually running them in production today. All right, so we've created this platform, right? Docker is this open platform that developers can use to build their applications quickly and update them easily. And IT operations teams can use to actually orchestrate and manage and scale their applications across their production environments. So we created something called containers as a service. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is and its value to the enterprise a little later on in this presentation. But I do want you to be aware of this, this phrase, if you hear it, if, or if you've heard it in the past, this thing called CAS, or containers as a service, okay? Um, and, you know, it's we're now a, not only an open source company, but now a, a commercial product as well. And um, that's kind of what Docker Inc. is here, right? Just for a differentiation sake. I know a lot of you are familiar with the brand itself. So uh, we're not just doing it just to do it, right? We've realized that there's really three key enterprise initiatives that are taking place today. And our goal is to help enable this, all right? So the first one is microservices. So microservices are these loosely coupled together services that come together to form an application, right? This is kind of how new applications are being built. In the past, it was all about monoliths or monolithic applications. Uh, these applications have all shared the same code base. But over time, they became more complex, they're difficult to manage, and they're expensive. Right, so now teams have pivoted and they're looking to actually create these new microservice-based applications. Um, and I see some folks are having audio issues. If, if there are audio issues or you can't hear me well, uh, please send me a ping. It's hard to kind of get through all the, uh, <laughs> the requests and present as well. So if you can't hear me, please let me know that. I want to make sure everyone is on the same page. Um, but three out of four companies are looking to actually embrace this concept of microservices. We also have DevOps. All right, DevOps is um, breaking down that traditional barrier that has existed between developers and IT operations teams. Right? Developers want to be able to build their applications, and IT operations teams need to be able to create or secure and manage and standardize their overall environment. All right, so we have this kind of going DevOps culture that we've seen where it's kind of this cultural take on bringing these two groups together and helping to develop these more streamlined you know, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline so they can deploy applications more quickly to production. And we see about 44% of companies are actually looking to adopt this methodology. And the last one is around um, um, Docker's how, how the cloud, right? So 80% of companies are looking to embrace the cloud and, and Docker is a central strategy to enabling this. 
Uh, let me just check on the sound real quick. Okay, folks, folks are good. No worries, I think we're good. <laughs> uh, no, no worries, Kenneth and Abel. Thank you for that reminder. So the Docker mission, and it's always been this, even when we started as an open source company back in 2013 to now when, when we announced our new um, commercial product in February of earlier this year, right? Our mission is to help teams build, ship, and run any application anywhere. Right? When we say any application, that means it, it could be monolithic applications, right? Um, you can still containerize legacy applications, and we have teams doing that today, right? Companies like ADP, companies like uh, Merck or, or PayPal. And the reason they do that is they want to benefit from the portability that Docker containers provide. But we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but also this concept of distributed applications, right, where you, you basically use Docker containers to containerize each of the, um, the pieces that make up this distributed application, containerize it, and then move them across any environment and deploy them as one fully running application in production. What's really crucial to that is flexibility and the ability for the Docker containers to run in any environment, right? We have these hybrid environments that exist today, right? So the Docker engine, the thing that actually creates and deploys and runs a container, can run on any laptop, right? So it can be Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows. Um, it could be a physical server, or it could be a cloud as well, right? And a key part of that is not limiting to one OS, right? So you have the ability to run uh, the engine on the Linux OS or even Windows Server 2016, which is what we announced uh, a few weeks back. All right, so the, the mission is to help enable the three initiatives that we talked about before, right? Cloud, DevOps, and microservices. So there's two key groups that we want to help here, right, and, and to enable. And we have the developers as well as the IT operations teams. So uh, developers, we talked a little bit about this before, but um, in terms of agility portability control, they require the ability to quickly create and deploy their applications. Right, they also on on the hook for actually going out and not only defining what an application needs to run, but if something goes wrong or if a bug arises, they are the ones who have to go out and fix the source code and deploy a patch. Now on the IT operations side, it's a little different, right? Their goal is to keep up with not only the SLAs that the customers have come to expect, but the changing business needs. So they need that flexibility and the agility to actually respond to changing business needs quickly. Um, they also need to be able to control their environment, right? They're the ones who are tasked with actually going out, making sure that their applications are secure, making sure that there's high availability, that there's low balancing within their actual production environment. And the portability, of course, is one of the most important pieces and perhaps one of the main reasons why folks turn to Docker initially, right? It's the portability that Docker containers provide. You have portability not only across different teams, right, where you can have a maybe an application development process that as a different team for development and testing and staging and then production. Right? What you can do is have that same application, the same code run the exact same way that it does in development, in testing stage and production. And what that does is helps you streamline your overall uh, pipeline, right? But it's also about having portability across environments, right? So maybe you, you know, are an Azure user and you wanna be able to you know, migrate your applications over to let's say AWS for instance, right? Typically it's hard to do that unless you have Docker containers, which give you that portability to move from one environment to another. Or you're looking at moving your stuff that's running on maybe, I don't know, OpenStack and migrating that over to Azure or AWS. You can easily do that using Docker containers. And then infrastructure as well, okay? So that brings us to Docker data center. Right, so I know a lot of you have heard about it. It's the main reason why you're on this presentation to begin with, but the way we define Docker data center is this. We have this commercial solution that's built to deliver container orchestration, right? So the scheduling and management of containers, a registry, which helps you store and manage um, and secure your image content and commercial support for the Docker engine. Okay, so the Docker engine, again, is kind of the, the heart of it all. It's the thing that creates and runs a container. And we have uh, commercial support for it. So we issue patches and hotfixes and things like that. Um, what DDC is doing is actually providing 
this managed framework for IT operations teams so they can actually go out and manage and secure their app environment, but at the same time, enable their developers to build applications in a self-service manner. All right, so we're creating a pool of, let's say, okayed content, right? Stuff that's been cleared for use in production that your IT operations team can, you know, um, spread out this pool and then your developers can come in and pull from this pool to build their new applications and iterate upon that. All right, so we've called this service, right? This thing that enables this is containers as a service. So Docker data center delivers containers as a service. So here's a quick look at this Docker data center on premises platform, right? So this is our enterprise grade commercial solution, right? Um, and this is kind of a snapshot of what's included there. So you have the Docker engine. Now uh, this is the container runtime. It has built-in orchestration. Uh, you might've heard of uh, swarm mode and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, but um, the built-in orchestration side where, which is basically the clustering and scheduling and management aspect of the platform. Um, you have networking, plugins, volumes as well. Um, and then you have this registry, right? So you might've heard of Docker Trusted Registry. It's um, an on-premises registry where you can actually store your image content and have secure collaboration for that. So you can actually control who has access to what images and um, apply role-based access controls to them. And again, it deploys within your own firewall along with the rest of this actual platform. And then you have universal control plane. So this is the management layer of the platform, right? There's a GUI involved for it. Um, you can orchestrate, you can manage, you can deploy, you can scale your applications, you can set up different ways of um, um, spreading your, your containers across your nodes that are within the cluster. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it, right? It's kind of, kind of your eyes into your Docker container environment. And then you have security, right? Security is kind of spread across this entire platform. It's all integrated within the commercial supported engine, right? We have tools like Docker Content Trust, which is a part of Docker Trusted Registry, which enables you to actually go out and sign images and ensure that you're running the latest version of that image and that it hasn't been tampered with with anyone. Um, there's the ability to set role-based access controls so you control who has access to your images in your Docker Trusted Registry, who has access to your universal control plane instances and can actually go in and manage nodes, deploy applications, um, scale out the number of containers you have, et cetera. All right, and then we have the infrastructure. So the actual platform can run in any environment. It can run in AWS or Azure in the public cloud. It can run in any virtual environment. It can run on any physical or converged infrastructure as well, right? And again, the key thing there is that the engine, as long as the engine can install on it, which it can install anywhere today, or it's the announcement of Windows Server 2016, right, um, as well as Linux, then you can run containers on top of it. So here's just a quick look at um, kind of what that build, ship, run workflow looks like. And I know there's, seems like there's a bit of a, an error there, some overlap of some of the images and words, so disregard that. But basically you have this, um, you have developers, you have IT operations teams, and you have this kind of handoff at the ship point. So the build team, the developer team goes out, they use Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, which is just, an easy way to use Docker on a Mac device or Windows device um, to create applications and then you build something called an image, right? That image is just a snapshot of an application, but it's the static thing that needs to be stored somewhere. And we store it in what's called a registry, right? In the case of Docker Data Center, it's Docker Trusted Registry. All right, so at, this, at the ship point, you have the developer who's created the app already, shipped it to this central location being the registry, and then at this point, the IT operations team can come in and pull that image and then run it in production using universal control plane. All right, so hopefully that flow kind of makes sense. But, you know, at the Docker Trusted Registry standpoint, like I mentioned, you, you know, you see that little key there is basically the ability to sign an image and then um, basically have a digital signature for each of those images. Um, so you can ensure that, you know, the correct person has created this image that it's legitimate and it hasn't been gone up and, and tampered with, with some kind of third party. Um, Universal Control Plane gives you the ability to run your applications across your nodes in any cloud or on-premises environment. And you actually have four, full portability between those. So you can move um, your containers and your applications from the cloud down to your on-premises side or physical converged infrastructure and back as well. So it's really just giving the flexibility to um, 
deploy your applications and run them wherever it makes the most business sense. All right. In some cases, maybe you want to, you know, move from VMware, which can be maybe more expensive sometimes, down to um, OpenStack, or you want to start using VMware and you want to port everything over from OpenStack to VMware, or whatever it might be. Right. You have that full flexibility that you require. All right. So some of the key benefits that folks have seen from using Docker Data Center and just containers as a service has been agility, portability, and control, right? We don't just say that it's, it's, it's a, a true value add to the enterprise today. Um, they're able to de deploy more software more often, so about 13x. Um, they're able to reduce mean time to remediation, right? So maybe there's a, a patch that needs to be made. They can easily go out and, and uh, create an updated version of an image and have the, the IT ops team run that in production, right? That's a 62% reduction. Um, in the time it takes to MTTR. Um, in terms of portability, 41% are moving workloads across pri private and public cloud events using uh, Docker containers as a service today. And what's really cool is we're enabling folks to eliminate these issues of what we call works on my machine. So you have maybe a developer who's created an application, they move it over to testing, your test team is like, whoa, what's going on here? Like, you, you sent me something that's shoddy, it's not working, and a lot of that is because of the the um, inconsistencies between the different infrastructure and the environment that's being used at the dev stage and the test stage and the staging and production stages. Um, so by having that portability and having the same source code work the same exact way in each of those stages, you're able to eliminate these works on my machine issues. Um, and another aspect is control. So part of that is security, right? Being able to have a um, and a solution that deploys on-premises by your own firewall, but it's also about being able to utilize your infrastructure more efficiently and reduce costs. So um, people are using containers have been able to um, better utilize their resources, in most cases virtual machines, by 20x, right? And the reason that's happening is because you can actually run Docker containers within virtual machines. So it helps you in terms of infrastructure optimization. Because of that, you have teams who have received a, or experienced a 44% reduced use in amount of VMs, right, by greater than 25%. So that's gonna cut down your cost, it's gonna cut down on the hypervisor licensing costs associated with that as well, shrink your footprint and make it easier for you to actually go out and manage your, your overall applications and your virtual machine. Um, here are just a few customers that um, have trusted in Docker Data Center today, there's ADP, um, there's Merck and there's PayPal, and I won't go through each of these extensively. I'm more than happy to answer, you know, questions if, if possible around these later on. But I do want to make sure that we get to this demo. I know this is really what you guys are looking to hear, and hopefully that overview was um, was beneficial. So at this point, what I'll do is I'll transition over to Moni. And Moni, I'll pass the ball over to you, and um, really looking forward to uh, the actual demo of Docker Data Center. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm, I hope everybody can hear me just fine. I know there's some <clears throat> some audio issues, but uh, power power through here. Um, yeah, man. So clear. Awesome, awesome. All right, everybody. Um, so first off, um, my name is Moni Salam. I'm a solutions engineer here at Docker Inc. Um, and I'm about to share my screen in a second here. Cool. I think. You guys can see my screen. Chris, can you see it? Just give me a yep. A little Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so here's what I here's kind of what I plan to do. I'm going to kind of give a overview into the different uh, components of Docker Data Center. Kind of show some of the the bells and whistles, if you will, and then run through a CI CD use case, um, and then hopefully at the very end maybe get into a container self-service um, use case and, and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll illuminate what, what exactly I mean by those if, if those terms aren't, aren't uh, familiar to anybody on the call. Um, so yeah, so okay, uh, what we're looking at right now is the Universal Control Plane tool. This is all running on my Mac, actually, um, so I don't really have DNS set up, but um, so Universal Control Plane is a management tool, uh, basically um, a management interface uh, on top of Swarm, which is um, Docker's native clustering solution. Um, 
And as you can see, this is kind of meant to be a cluster management tool. So I actually have insight into, you know, cluster-wide resources, whether they be actual, you know, physical or virtual nodes, kind of some high-level stats on those. Uh, the container images I have in my system, the current live running number of containers I have, and then my, my given applications. Um, so just want to give an overview of what I'm basically running in my cluster here. So uh, I think the ends, um, two generic, you know, call them app nodes, build nodes. Um, one, one VM running Docker Trusted Registry, um, which as Chris explained is the uh, container image repository um, that can be run, you know, on-premise in any cloud of your choice. Um, you cross, right, an on-premise or, you know, a hybrid situation where you're running on-premise or in the cloud. Um, I have a VM basically used to house uh, Jenkins, a Jenkins container, and it kind of used it as a de facto build environment. And I'll kind of show you guys that in a couple seconds here. Um, but for those not familiar with Jenkins, it's just a, a CI. It's a tool that's, that's very convenient for continuous integration testing, um, as well as, uh, as other things. Um, and then a node running the notary service, which uh, does the image signing um, that Chris talked about earlier. Um, so essentially, uh, uh, the notary service allows a given user in Docker Data Center um, through certificate-based um, cryptography and signing to basically sign an image so that you can attribute uh, where that image came from to a specific team or a specific user. Um, that way, it's, you know, just another guardrail or another uh, a measure to make sure that basically all the content in your environment not only came internally, but right the goal is to be able to track and you know kind of enforce policy around you know, who would sign a given image um, and things of that nature. And then finally, the the VM that's running right this this management uh, this management software. So first thing i just like to highlight is there's this ability to basically attach labels to different nodes. And just actually, I'll set the stage. So when I refer to a node, I just mean anything running the Docker engine, right? So the engine is basically whenever you would type in a Docker command, right, the engine is what, is what does the heavy lifting. Um, so right now, right, I have six VMs. I have six nodes running six engines. Um, and what I can do is I can actually attach labels to each one of these engines. And that can be used for a multitude of different things, one of them being multi-tenancy, one of them, um, another being, uh, you know, I want to see basically where certain services or containers get scheduled on. I can essentially attach these labels and then use those requisite labels for really policy of any sort. Um, so, for example, if I have an application dependent on a certain OS package, a certain kernel version, I can actually embed that either at the you know, container launch time or in a Docker Compose file. Um, uh, so you know, there's different ways of, of I guess, you know, doing multi-tenancy and, and enforcing policy just through, just through that, that means. And it's pretty flexible, um, uh, pretty flexible and robust there. Um, so let's get into some of the, the bells and whistles here real quick. Um, so actually, first off, let me show the application view. Um, so essentially, uh, the Docker Trusted Registry is just itself a microservices application that you can actually manage through UCP. It has its own UI, um, and then right these different containers that you know serve the API, house the registry, um, you know some off, some uh, authentication, storage, and things of that nature. Um, I also have Elk Stacks so of Elasticsearch. Logstash Kibana, just as a monitoring solution. Um, Interlock, which I'll get into in a couple seconds here, but this is just basically the way that we accomplish um, service discovery and load balancing in Docker Data Center at the moment. Um, so in this cur current iteration, you kind of have to plug in um, extra, uh, you have to plug in some extra tools to to kind of get the the load balancing and service discovery functionality, but that is built into the the next iteration of the product here. Um, Notary, which is right what I just talked about in terms of the the image signing capability, and that is also a microservices application. Big surprise. 
Um, and then kind of which will be the basis of our CI CD demo, I have a, just kind of a toy, a toy voting app. Um, and I'll get into that in just a second here, right after I show off some of these, some of these bells and whistles. So actually, for, let's pretend like that registry window is not open. I can drill down into uh, singleton containers. I can grab logs. I can grab. Uh, you'll see. Hopefully, these will load in a couple of seconds here. Uh, maybe not. But I can also grab stats, CPU that should populate soon here. Uh, uh. Maybe, maybe not. Um, anyway, so there's a bunch of metadata I can get uh, through the applications view. Um, I can also navigate to the UI through this view, which is kind of the purpose of why I why I drilled down. But so so I can, so Docker Trusted Registry, you can think of it as a central point um, through which you can link multiple systems together. So if you have a dev system, a test system, and a production system. They can all use the same Docker Trusted Registry resource, and through versioning, role-based access controls, and uh, you know different plugins for CI for any really any CI tool of your choice. Um, it's a really big DevOps enabler, uh, as well as just production deployment enabler, or what we like to call right CAS, right containers as a service. So really can enable enable you to do a lot of different things, whether you're you know a developer or an operations engineer. Um, so I have these different repositories set up. Um, I can have different organizations which have essentially different teams, right, with different users assigned to them um, and different repositories that are associated with them. Let me find one real quick. Commercial pod, let's see. A repository, right, so you can see the different repositories that are actually attributed to given teams. So there is this granular organizational um, uh, organizational structure that's inherent to DTR. And how, how can you accomplish that? Well, there's a way to plug in LDAP. Um, um, so essentially, you know, if you have this infrastructure in place, um, it's pretty simple to, to kind of just, you know, plug in, plug in any LDAP server that you might have, right, if you want to implement SSO um, and, and different uh, authentication mechanisms. Um, there's also agnostic storage. So essentially, if you want to run, you know, an NFS mount or, or some storage array right on a file system, there's uh, plugins for that. There's also plugins for S3. So if you're running an AWS or, you know, a storage array that essentially has S3 APIs, right, that um, you can do that with DTR. There's Azure Storage, Swift. Um, so, you know, Docker has a very agnostic view uh, when it comes to, you know, networking, storage. Uh, we have our own native solutions, but also, you know, we try to be as uh, pluggable and swappable uh, as possible. Um, one other big feature is just garbage collection. So if anybody's worked with containers before, um, you know, it's pretty easy to, um, you know, spin up containers, trash them, and kind of, you know, start to bloat, let's say, your environment. Um, and basically, we built this thing called garbage collection, which essentially will remove any unused image layers, any unused images. Um, and you can configure, basically, a, a policy to go ahead and do that. Um, uh, one other thing, just in regards to role-based access control. Uh, so I can actually create different users, and then I have four different levels of access. Um, which both which correspond to both access to content in the repository as well as access to the uh, cluster management um, resources. So you know launching containers, um, starting them, stopping them, uh, things of that nature. And each one of these is documented as, as to as to what they actually mean right from an operations perspective. Um, so I think let's get into the actual, CI workflow here. So I am going to show you a voting app, but I just want to kind of give some background on what this app actually does. So this is a this is kind of the architecture of an app um, as a, of a microservices application. So essentially, I have two display containers: one called Voting App, one called Result App. Um, they're both registered with um, a software load balancer. Uh, and as well as DNS, and that's accomplished through um, the interlock 
uh, NGINX stack, um, which in just a second I'll kind of show you the, the code that generated that. But essentially I have a Redis queue which stores session data, so this basically um, uh, ensures that uh, certain requests from a given user get routed to the same back-end server. So it kind of implements that, you know, if you've heard quote-unquote sticky session. Um, and then I have a basically a worker, which is just a, a .NET worker um, that essentially takes and puts stores into a database and then also reads from that database uh, and displays into this, this result view here. Um, so just a quick note on the load balancing. Um, so there's there's basically a, um, some good some good tools uh, some good tools and good reading as to um, you know what what different components actually accomplish the role of service discovery and load balancing. So first off, nginx is actual uh, resource that does you know request routing. Um, and interlock is a event listener. So essentially, the every Docker engine has an events API that um, whenever a container goes up or goes down, gets an IP address, uh, essentially the engine publishes to this API. Uh, interlock is just basically a tightly coupled uh, tool that just listens on this API and then will update the Nginx system of record uh, accordingly. So when a container goes up, it'll essentially update Nginx, say, you know, I have this container sitting at this IP address, and then, you know, if a container goes down, right, it'll remove from that system of record. Uh, um, and that can be de deployed with a Docker Compose file. So everything that I'm about to show is deployed with Docker Compose, which is essentially just a tool that allows um, so it's it's really a microservices enabler. It allows you to take multiple containers and link them together. Um, and so Shocker Interlock, the event right, the event listener is a container, um, and it listens to the Swarm Manager uh, event API. Um, so essentially, that's kind of an aggregation of all the Docker Engine event publications. And then essentially, I have an Nginx container as well, all all deployed in the same uh, the same Docker Compose stack here. So I basically just dictate the image um, and what command to run, what ports to expose, right? And the, basically the documentation for, for, for all of this is self-contained in, in, uh, in, in this GitHub, but you can find it uh, on our website as well. Um, so okay, without further ado, let me just go ahead and access this app. So I actually, I'll show you real quick the the compose file of this application. So essentially, I have uh, a service called Voting App, which is that first front end container result app, the second front end container, the worker that I, that I uh, the dot net worker, the Redis queue, right, which does the session store, a database, right, to hold basically the, the information, and then a couple software defined um, resources here. So software defined storage, um, which in Docker we call them volumes. Um, and there are different drivers for you know, third-party storage, uh, third-party storage plugin um, makers, and, and there are a bunch out there, um, like EMC. EMC has one I believe it's called Rexray. There's Flocker, um, different drivers for that, and then networks, uh, which are software defined as well. And if you don't pass in any arguments, it just uses the the default uh, Docker native stuff. Um, so right with networks, there's also it's software defined. There's also a way of dictating the, you know, IP address. You can also point to a different party driver. Um, you know, there's a bunch like Weave. Uh, Cisco has one called Contib. So you know, just kind of along the same vein of the pluggable, pluggable architecture. Um, batteries included, I guess is the is the term you like to say. Um, but the one thing I wanted to point out is this this right here. These labels so I'm basically registering with interlock so this is the syntax of how you would use interlock in a compose file right you say here's the host name the domain name and then this I'm actually using the the engine labels that I showed you earlier right so I'm actually steering and I'm saying I want this container to run on a specific node right so that's just one way you can you can use the labels from before um, and okay so let's kind of see this in action here. 
So, okay, I don't know. If you guys were at DockerCon, you've probably seen uh, this demo before. But so these are the two containers, the, the one that takes in an input of some sort and then the one that displays what's in the database. So let's cross our fingers here. Okay, cool. We're working. Up. Oh, all right. So they're actually this um, this uh, piece of code. I think has a little but I think you get the point. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and change this. So so essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a a server that's hooked up to this GitHub re repo right here. So inside this repo, I have all the code that basically generated that application. So I have the Docker Compose file. Um, the code that makes up the result container, the code that makes up the vote container, the code that makes up the .NET worker, and then the Redis queue and the database are just off the shelf from Docker Hub. Um, so what I'm going to do is essentially uh, make a change, push it to this GitHub, which will trigger a Jenkins build. Um, Jenkins, this is the, the UI for Jenkins. This is running inside a container, um, and I'll show what, what I'll do is I'll push and then show you kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so as you can see, I kind of have the, the GitHub repo mounted here. I'm going to go inside. I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to go inside the, and I'm just going to change the voting prompt. And this is kind of trivial, but I mean, you can imagine somebody iterating on an application, finding a bug. I'm not, I'm not really a developer, so um, yeah, I can't really show off <laughs> any bug fixing ability, let's say. But um, the functionality is still right; is still the same. So I'm changing the vote. Um, I'm going to go ahead and commit the change. So we got a, we got basically we pushed the new version of the of the application, which uh, eventually will cause a Jenkins build to kick off, and I'll show you exactly what this build is going to do. Um, if we can, there we go. Well, got to reload in. So. So basically just a uh, GitHub, right, a webhook into my GitHub, um, GitHub account, right, my master branch, um, and typically, right, a, an organization would leverage multiple branches. Um, use the, the master branch as really this, uh, right, this kickoff of the CI chain. Um, and I'm basically, since it's running on my laptop, I'm actively pulling the GitHub repo rather than having it basically pull me when a change is pushed. Um, and that's just because I just don't want to expose my laptop to the, the outside world. But um, essentially, I have a pretty pretty basic build process. But this is kind of one of the value adds when you're running, you know, a, a Docker native stack on top of the Docker engine is that I have access to every single Docker command, every single single Docker API throughout my cluster. And so I can now utilize tools like Jenkins to do Docker things, right, Docker workloads, um, whether that's actually rebuilding, right, rebuilding an application, spinning up a test container. Um, there's a, there's basically, I mean, the, the possibilities are, are really endless. Anything you can do with Docker, right, you can essentially do with, you know, Jenkins or any tool that's really running on top of Docker, right, by, pat, by basically just tapping into the API. Um, so let's see if this guy, yeah, okay, cool. So it's building, let's look at the console output. Um, so we're basically fetching a bunch of Node.js packages, we're building them, um, just basically rebuilding every container that makes up that microservices app. Um, wait a little bit here until we see the success. And, and just to clarify, um, Right, if there's any confusion, I just want to show one one thing while this is building. Each one of these repositories 
So it's always have a Docker file. Right, with the requisite commands that allow you to build a Docker image. Um, and that's essentially what's being executed inside of Jenkins. It's really taking this, this source code, um, basically, and then taking the source code and creating a container image based on the blueprint defined in this Docker file. So everything's pretty self-contained, right? And when you're, when you're talking about Docker and containers, um, which is nice. So, uh, right, can self-contain containers, um, kind of the, the concept there. So finished, got a success. We go over here, we refresh. Oh. Okay, cool. So we got, basically we got the update. Let's go ahead and make sure our load balancing is working. Um, we'll go in here, go to the voting app. Oh. Of course, during the demo, we get some technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, life is never easy, right? So um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the front end container. And so I guess I'll back up for a second. So one of the, one of the advantages of microservices, right, or re-architecting re your, let's say, given application to, to have like a microservices architecture is, I can actually scale and update uh, the different components of an application independently of each other, right? And there's so many right value value adds to that to that process, right? Of being able to just you know feature velocity or or even you know scalability. So let's kind of see that. Um, so it's really right. I can scale a front end container. Um, a bunch of times before I need to let's say scale a worker container. So it's really getting the most efficiency, right? The the most bang for your buck there. So let's see. I'm going to open up a new window. Go to the same guy. Okay, cool. So if you if you notice I'm getting basically I'm getting processed by a different container every time. So just showing that right there's a, there's load balancing going on um, and essentially service discovery right that my my application essentially almost gets its own virtual, you know, virtual IP, virtual DNS record, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, the only thing I'll say there is, if I interject, like if you're a company, yep. like you're like PayPal or something, and you know maybe it's holiday season and it's peak usage, this ability to scale out allows you know you to actually, I guess, come up to speed and actually address the demand that your users and your customers are pushing on you, especially in times of peak usage. Right, right. So it's you know just elasticity, um, elasticity while still you know maintaining some ease of management there. Um, I, I guess that's that's the overall goal. Um, so I guess to the, the the last thing I want to demo um, is a kind of self service use case. So um, the other day I was actually so I was demoing you know demoing to somebody who wanted to see Docker Data Center and they were basically like, so how would um, a developer, if I'm just using this as a self-service tool where developers can spin up their own container environments, right, how would they how would they use this in conjunction with, you know, Docker Trusted Registry and create curated images, et cetera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh-oh, okay, whew, that scared me. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, basically spin up a container from this repository um, and then basically access it, right? So I have a company curated version of CentOS, right? Whatever, you know, I don't know what I did to really curate it, but right, let's just pretend that I'm an operating systems guy. Um, getting some lag here, but let's pretend I'm an operating system guy. And uh, I want to make sure that, you know, my developers only use our, you know, our uh, approved version of CentOS. Um, and basically, I would go ahead and take that version, put it into the registry, and, uh, you know, ensure that my developers only use that version. Um, so while that's loading, I'm going to hopefully just go ahead and launch this container. So essentially, you can launch singleton containers. Um, and just basically give it an image name. So, you know, if you had DNS, obviously it wouldn't be some ugly raw IP. Um, but, um, right, the, the kind of the syntax is uh, the image name is actually the name of the uh, repository. Um, 
or sorry, the, the domain number of the repository, the name of the organization, and then the, uh, the uh, actual name of the image itself, right? So um, that allows you to have different tags. So tags would be like, right, if you're looking at my screen, if I am latest or 1.0, it should, should have showed up on this. The UI is kind of hanging for me. Let's see. Come on. All right, well, hopefully this works. We'll, we'll uh, pray to the, the demo gods here, as they say. Okay, we'll try it. CentOS container name, testy123. Um, and let's see here. I just want to run that show, see what happens. All right, wow, cool. Okay, so the, the UI seems to be hanging, but the actual registry is working. So that's good. Um, so actually here, let's see where this guy got. Okay, so it's got scheduled on app node two. So essentially I have a container waiting for me on app node two. So I'm using Vagrant, right? I do Vagrant SSH, but right, you get the, the overall concept is that, you know, I have a set aside resource for a developer I didn't have to do any, like me, you know, let's say I have split personality syndrome. I'm both a developer and an operations uh, engineer. I didn't have to really communicate with my other, you know, part of my schizophrenic brain to really spin up this resource that I wanted, right? I wanted a clean slate CentOS image. So now I can actually go ahead and access this set image. Um, oh, whoops. And there we go. So now I'm inside my own clean container, um, and I can start to to write, iterate, and, and start to build, um, or just write, write, uh, actually um, uh, actually use this container uh, to to build a microservices application. Um, there, there's a whole suite of things things I can do, and that's one of the good parts about Docker. Is, you know, microservices is one thing that it enables, but um, Right, there's a lot of a lot of other cool things you can do, um, right? Just with, with the the underlying container technology, the clustering, um, and then the API. Uh, so I guess that's it's kind of the gist. This overall demo. Um, I don't know how much time we have. What do we have? Eleven minutes, Chris? So is it? Yeah, we have about eleven I, minutes. Yeah, no. Did I end too early? Or all right, cool. <laughs> no, I have uh, just a couple more slides. I'm going to show. Let me take back. Yeah. Here, you want me to throw the ball back? Yeah. All right. Great. Let me take it back. Stop sharing. Got it. All right. You got it. So I just want to kind of touch on a couple more things. It's kind of like how do you actually get your hands on it, right? Um, so Docker Data Center is sold as a subscription, right? So there's two different versions of it. There's Business Day and Business Critical, right? I know. Very creative. Right, so business day is um, <laughs> it's all price per node first off, um, but business day is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's you're getting the universal control plane, Docker trusted registry, and commercial support for the Docker engine at agreed upon SLAs that are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. local time. On the business critical side, again, you're getting universal control plane, Docker trusted registry, and commercial support for the Docker engine. But on the business critical side, it's 24-7, 365. A couple things I want to mention here. So universal control plane and Docker trusted registry, you can have as many instances as you'd like, right? So as many GUIs as you'd like. We're not charging based on that at all. It's just charged based on the actual engine itself, right? So it's price per node. And a node is just anything with a Docker engine installed on top of it, right? So it could be a bare metal server. It could be a VM or it could be a cloud instance. Right, that's the only thing you're being um, actually priced on. Right, so I think that's just an important thing to actually showcase. I know some folks are like, oh, okay, what, how do I actually access it? How is it priced? What am I getting with it? So hopefully that kind of answers the question there and clears the air. Um, so the next question is, why would you invest in the subscription versus going with an open source Docker or some other company that might be out there? Um, some of the, the, the real value is, the fact that this is a platform that was built by Docker for Docker, right? This is supported by Docker itself, right? 
I know a lot of folks say, hey, we support Docker, we support Docker, which is, I mean, I just want you to be careful on that because the only way you can get support from Docker is if it's from Docker or it's from one of our partners, being IBM, HPE, or now Microsoft. Um, so again, you're getting universal control by DTR and the commercial support of Docker engine. All that is built natively, right? So I know there's a couple questions around, hey, is, you know, Docker Trusted Registry and UCP going to work with, you know, swarm mode that is coming up in the next um, rev, which will be announced shortly uh, within a few weeks. I'll say that. Um, but another thing is, and I know Moni touched on this before, is the fact that by leveraging this Docker native platform that is hosted locally by you and su supported by us, um, you also have access to all the different APIs and, and integrations there, right? So the full set of Docker APIs are all able to be utilized by Docker Data Center, um, but you get it in support from the Docker team as well, right? So what we mean by that is now we validate certain configurations for when you bring in new infrastructure to your environment. We provide uh, patches and hot fixes and support for previous versions of an engine, All right? So this uh, a kind of basic example is why you would go maybe the commercial versus the open source, right? So we love that people have used our open source project. Uh, that is awesome, right? That is the bread and butter of how we became Docker today. But the reality is if you are in a company, right, we iterate that about every two months as an update to the engine. A lot of enterprise teams can't really keep up with that pace. So what they need to do is have a supported version of an engine, but they need it, they need support for previous versions of that as well, because they're not able to keep up with that two month kind of cycle. That's a big reason for why you would want to invest in the subscription itself, right? So you're getting not only, it's not just the support, but you're getting these um, support for previous versions of an image so that you can continue to build your applications and not have to update that engine as often. In addition to this software that is all native and is built for the enterprise and deployed on premises behind your firewall. Okay, so that's just one thing I want to iterate there. And I just want you to be careful of people saying they support Docker because there's only a few ways to actually get true support for the Docker engine. I think that's important for all of you as consumers and potential customers um, to just realize. The last thing is we did announce a, a bunch of awesome partnerships. So actually, let me go back to this. So not only can you get Docker Data Center from Docker itself, but you can get it from HPE or Microsoft, right? So I don't know the folks out there in the audience, you might be a customer of HPE, right? Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, so every HPE x86 ProLiant server ships out of the box with the Docker engine already pre-installed, right? So you have access to the commercially supported Docker engine, and then all you would do is just upgrade to Docker Data Center. Same thing with Windows Server 2016, which we announced a few weeks ago. So if you are a Windows Server 2016 customer or will be in the near future, um, it actually had built-in commercially supported Docker engine already built into that server, right? that OS. Um, and then you can just upgrade to the Docker Data Center um, platform itself, the rest of the Docker Data Center uh, platform. Again, CS Engine is part of Docker Data Center, right? Um, so hopefully that made sense and didn't confuse you further. Um, I know we're moving at a really crazy pace here at the company, and we really appreciate you guys, you know, taking the time to hear us and, and kind of keep up with that pace. Um, here's just a list of, you know, a few customers of ours. Um, and it's important to realize that these are, Docker's used in production, Docker data centers used in production across many different verticals, right? It's not a single industry. You don't have to feel like, hey, if you're education, you know, you can only use it if you're, I don't know, in the payment industry or government. That's not the case, right? There's folks in e-commerce, education, healthcare, and tech, and, you know, and in general, especially in government as well, as we bring on more certifications and, and grow in the federal space as well. So, um, again, thank you all for being here. We have a couple minutes left. I want to take some questions if we can. Um, so let me hop over to uh, the WebEx portal and see what we got here. Okay, um, one of the questions, let's see. Let's see. Um, when will UCP fully support swarm mode? Um, so that's gonna be in the newest version of DDC with 112, which will be released in a few weeks actually. So we're really excited about that. Um, I don't wanna to share too much. I know there's some really cool stuff going on there. Um, but you can fully expect that UCP and Docker Data Center will be working with Swarm Mode. Um, let's see. 
we got a question around can DTR run with Docker Data Center as an on-premises solution to store Docker images? So yes, DTR is a part of Docker Data Center, right? Which I, which I stressed before, it includes DTR, UCP, and commercial support for the Docker engine. Um, the reason we built it that way is because we believe in the value of um, the integration between those solutions and the ability to streamline uh, application development processes and help you to your IT ops deploy faster and your developers actually build faster. Um, do we really need UCP on Swarm? Is it mandatory? Um, so we get this question a lot. It's kind of like, oh, we, we love Docker Trust Registry. We don't really know about UCP yet. You know, we're looking at it. Um, so we, again, we position it as a full platform, right? We can always be flexible. If you're only looking at DTR, more than happy to talk to you about it. But we do want to stress the point as at a certain point, right, and every company is at a different maturation level, there's going to be a need to actually manage and deploy your applications across a cluster, right, multiple nodes. And we call this orchestration. When you want to look at orchestration, the solution you want to look at is, and especially if you're using Docker containers, is universal control plane, because this is something that's built by Docker for Docker containers and is supported by us, but hosted locally by you. Right, so again, you're benefiting from that Docker ecosystem and the ability to work with the greater Docker ecosystem. Um, we got some questions around some of the competition, and I can follow up with you shortly around that. Um, let me show. So one of the questions we got is, can you show how to deploy a Docker image you built and push to DTR, then deploy that image to Docker Data Center? So it's kind of like, I know, Bodhi, you touched on it, but it's like, if you're a developer, you're using Docker and integration with Jenkins to push off a build. What you would do is you push that build to DTR. It's actually a command, like a Docker push that image to DTR. I don't think we have enough time to show that. And yeah, but, yeah, that would have just, sorry, that, so oh, in the demo, that would have just been inside of the Jenkins. Um, maybe I didn't, I, I should have highlighted that, uh, but uh, one of basically, instead of deploying directly onto a cluster, like the actual CI workflow would have been just to Docker Right, Docker tag, then Docker push. Um, right, doc or you could even do Docker compose tag, right, Docker compose push, and then it would push all the all the different images into DTR. Um, right, and, and then at which point you would just, if you're an IT ops person, let's say after that push has been made by the developer, you just go into DTR, you pull it and run it in universal control plane as a full-pledged running application. Right, exactly. Um, so is there an ability to integrate with a private cloud with Docker Data Center with API capability? Yep, of course. Cool. Um, so auto scaling of cluster nodes. So Binyam, I'm guessing your question is, is there the ability for auto, to have auto scaling of cluster nodes and to redistribute workloads? So I'm guessing in case of a failure and the answer to both of those is yes. Uh, and I know Modi showed the auto scaling of of the containers, um, and yes, there is a redistribution of the workload. Let's say if a container goes down, um, if you have three nodes, we have built-in high availability. So what it would do is, let's say a container is running on a node and that node goes down for some reason, we'd automatically reschedule and and schedule that container as um, onto another node, right? So that application isn't going down; right? it's being rescheduled onto um, a, a, another running node. As the node that just failed is bringing back. back <laughs> being brought back to health. Okay. Um, let's see. We got a question around Docker. What is the advantage of Docker Swarm um, versus Kubernetes? I think I won't talk too much about this. I know we have, a, we have like battle cards and all this, and I'd be more than happy to share. I just don't want to take too much of the time. Um, the big key here is that with Docker Swarm, it's Docker native, right? So you can utilize all the different Docker APIs. Um, Kubernetes, uh, I know it's been around for a while. It's fairly complex and difficult to actually set up. Uh, another thing is uh, it doesn't utilize all the different Docker APIs. So what you'll have to do is actually do a lot of conversions um, to actually utilize some of those APIs, which end up breaking the Docker API. Uh, we did some scalability testing between Docker Swarm and Kubernetes, and it showed that we are not only more scalable, but we have faster spin-up times for Docker containers as well. Um, and I know we're right against the hour. There's a bunch more questions. Um, I think what I'm going to do is just create like a blog with all these questions and 
post it out so everyone that will um, that has a question can get their answers. Um, I truly appreciate everyone for being here and taking the time to actually go out and listen to us. Moni, thanks so much for taking us through the demo and answering questions, dude. Yeah, no problem. All right, like I said, I'll be in touch, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'll get answers to your questions, and I look forward to having you all join future webinars. Thank you so much.